Essentially, reloading ammunition is all about controlling pressure. It's about adjusting a series of variables to control the pressure inside a cartridge and achieve a desired outcome. A good grouping on a target, a correctly adjusted load for hunting, or in the case of this straight pull AK, something cheap and cheerful to knock the targets down without too much recoil. For well over 150 years, two types of cartridge have dominated the shooting scene. Rimfire. Nowadays, the majority of rimfire cartridges are small bore calibers intended for target shooting or pest control. The rim of the cartridge, indicated here, is loaded with impact sensitive priming compound. The gun's firing pin hits and crushes the rim, setting off the compound and then the main powder charge. There are people who reload these, but rimfire brass is quite thin to begin with and the procedure is not straightforward. The second kind of ammunition is centerfire and is the system used with most other cartridges. The firing pin hits a primer cap located in the center of the cartridge. This then ignites the main powder charge. With certain exceptions, these can be reloaded multiple times until they wear out. This does include shotgun cartridges, but for the purposes of this series, we'll only be covering centerfire rifle and pistol cartridges whose cases are made of brass or other metal. These are known as metallic centerfire cartridges. You've probably heard the word ballistics used in detective films and TV shows. Send it down to ballistics. Don't you mean forensics? Whatever. Setting aside Hollywood's love affair with misnomers, ballistics is actually part of the physical science of mechanics, and for our purposes there are four headings of which we need to be aware. 1. Internal ballistics. This goes from ignition of the propellant and up until the projectile leaves the muzzle. 2. Transitional ballistics. The projectile's behavior after leaving the muzzle and until the pressure behind it is equalized. 3. External ballistics. The projectile's journey through the air and until it meets its target. 4. Terminal ballistics. What happens when the projectile does hit the target? Propellant has a bearing on all four items, but most of what we're looking at this time will relate to internal and a tiny bit of external ballistics. To fire properly, a gun has to have a very strong, precisely engineered space which can hold a cartridge in line with the barrel and then withstand considerable pressure without rupturing. This space is known as a chamber and different types of gun have different designs of chamber. A revolver has a cylinder with multiple chambers. A semi-auto pistol usually has a chamber machined into the rear of its barrel. Shotguns and rifles usually have a chamber either machined into the rear of the barrel or located right behind it. There are variations on this principle, especially with rifles, but for simplicity, we'll use this bolt action 308 rifle and a dummy round. There has to be enough tolerance for a cartridge to be inserted, form a tight gas seal when fired, and then be easily removed post firing. A gun's chamber is built to withstand very high pressures, albeit within set limits. Provided these limits are observed, the chamber will safely allow the cartridge case to expand and form a tight seal. Brass was found to be ideal for cartridge cases because it can expand and contract very rapidly. When we talk about chamber pressure, we're referring to the pressure exerted on a gun's chamber as the round is fired and before the bullet goes on its way. If we ignite nitro powder in air, it just burns away steadily until it's all gone. Confined inside the chamber of a gun, it's a very different story. When the primer is hit by the firing pin, it throws a shower of sparks all over the powder inside the cartridge. The powder kernels ignite and combust, producing copious amounts of hot exhaust gases. These gases elevate the chamber pressure. 
In a confined space, increased pressure intensifies the combustion, which in turn elevates the pressure, and so on. Eventually, something has to give, so the projectile is forced from its brass case and down the barrel of the gun. The bullet engages spiral grooves cut into the inside of the barrel and begins to rotate. The grooves are known as rifling, and even if you know nothing about guns, you've probably seen rifling depicted at the cinema without realizing it. With rifling, the twist rate is described as a ratio in inches. So if your projectile, for example, makes one complete turn every nine inches, the twist rate is one in nine. You can see here how the cleaning patch engages the rifling and makes the rod rotate. The rate at which the exhaust gases develop inside a cartridge is crucial and two of the variables affecting this are choice and quantity of powder. Pistols generally have the shortest barrels, so their projectiles need to stabilize in just a few inches before exiting the muzzle. This means pistol powders tend to be faster than other types. With shotguns, although their barrels are longer, they are effectively smooth tubes throwing a payload of shot, or perhaps a solid slug. There's no rifling to stiffen the friction, so shotgun barrels can also use faster powders. Thus, pistols and shotguns often share certain powders. Rifles, however, tend to need slower burning powders, which will allow for the friction of a bullet traveling down a longer rifled barrel, but without developing a dangerous pressure spike. Ideally, the pressure should just start to drop off as the bullet exits. You'll hear reloaders, and indeed powder manufacturers, talking about fast and slow powders. Nevertheless, there is no absolute scale of burn speeds. Powder speeds are stated in comparison to each other. In confinement, all powders ignite faster than a human can change their mind, so in absolute terms, the distinctions in speed are minuscule. Nevertheless, they are crucially important. The reason comes back to pressure. Here are some average chamber pressures for factory ammunition in popular calibers. 12 gauge starts us off with 11,500 pounds per square inch. Not to be outdone, the 3 inch 410 gives us 13,500 psi. The world's favourite rimfire cartridge 22 long rifle puts out 24,000 psi. Small but very, very pissed off, the 9mm Parabellum develops 35,000 psi. Taking one for the team, 45 ACP at 21,000. The 223 Remington ups the ante with 55,000 PSI. And here's the good old stalwart 308 Winchester at 62,000. There are a lot of factors bearing upon what pressures we end up with. But still, what may come as a surprise is how little powder is involved in generating some of these values. This 9mm round is loaded with only 4.5 grains of powder, but develops 35,000 psi. The charge of powder in this little 22 long rifle cartridge is 0.9 of a grain, and yet it develops 24,000 psi. As you get nearer the maximum load for a given caliber and bullet weight, tiny increments of powder charge become very significant indeed. One tenth of a grain can be the difference between a hot load and a catastrophic failure. Likewise, seating the bullet too deeply into the case. Less space remaining inside the case equals more pressure. At maximum loads, seating the bullet a few thousandths of an inch too deeply can change the speed the powder burns and elevate the pressure to dangerous levels. We'll go over this and more in parts three and four. However, if you're just starting out and unsure of what you're doing, always ask someone experienced and then check what they tell you against reliable, officially published literature. Don't risk turning your firearm into a pipe bomb. 
Well-made ammunition allows the chamber pressure to develop over a time interval which perfectly suits the firearm in question, but without producing dangerous pressure spikes. Getting it just right means the bullet is accelerating all the way to the muzzle. The powder burns efficiently with little wastage and the pressure curve is nice and steady. At best, overdoing it means excess gas, very hard recoil and difficulty extracting the fired case. At worst, it can mean a pressure spike and an exploding gun. Often, the bullet doesn't even make it out of the chamber. Underdoing it means the gas tapers off before the bullet gets to the end of the barrel. Combustion isn't sustained properly, so you'll get poor results and sometimes unburnt powder scattered everywhere. There's also a potential danger in using very light powder charges in large volume cases, but more of that later. In part three, we'll be looking into how smokeless powders are composed, exactly how they burn, and some do's and don'ts of using them in hand loading. Thank you.